All right, I want to welcome everyone to the uh, to the Fall Ozark Studies Lecture here at Missouri State University. We're uh, very excited tonight to have uh, one of our own back with us, uh, a former graduate student, uh, Blake Perkins. And uh, the, we have, uh, at least now, I guess for about seven or so years, uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, we have a minor in Ozark Studies here at Missouri State. It's the only minor of its kind uh, in the Ozarks. And I'm pretty sure there's no, no Ozark Studies minor anywhere outside of the Ozark. <laughs> uh, though, uh, you know, we could be surprised. Uh, but we do have a minor. We also have uh, the Ozark Studies Institute, which is now housed here in the library. And uh, puts out Ozarks Watch uh, magazine. Some of you have seen Ozarks Watch video magazine on OPT, but we actually uh, do still have a paper magazine, uh, the Ozarks Watch magazine, and uh, we have uh, our new magazine editor is here with us, Susan Croce Kelly is, is here, uh, our uh, just brand new editor, so we're excited to see what uh, what she does with the Ozark. We were just talking, uh, we'll bring some magazines downstairs. So okay. Yeah, that's, that's good. So when they're on the way out, they can grab one. And, okay, that, that sounds good. Yeah, make sure and get your complimentary Ozarks Watch magazine. Well, uh, so that's what we're doing here at Missouri State. We've, we've been doing these lectures uh, for, for several years. And, uh, and as I said, this is a, an especially uh, a special one for, for us. Uh, I have known uh, Blake now for, I guess it's been about 11 years. And, and I remember, it, I, I've known him since we were both in Arkansas, since I was teaching at, at a small college uh, called Lyon College in Arkansas, and he was a student there, and he came into my uh, office uh, one day and said he had just changed his major to history and was uh, wanting, to, wanting my permission to get into one of my upper-level history classes, even though he hadn't had the uh, prerequisite. And I didn't let him in, and it was the dumbest thing I ever did. I, I, <laughs> I, to date. Right, it's, uh, yeah, to date. Uh, yeah, hopefully it's the dumbest thing I'll ever do. Uh, but once I got him in class, I immediately recognized that he could have taught the class that I wouldn't let him into. And, uh, and we, uh, between undergraduate and graduate, uh, we uh, had about, what, 10 courses together or something. It was uh, pretty crazy. And, uh, but uh, Blake earned his uh, master's degree in history here at Missouri State back in 2010 and uh, went to West Virginia University where he earned his PhD in 2014. And his dissertation is, or this uh, book is his revised dissertation, Hillbilly Hellraisers. The dissertation wasn't called that. I don't, you know, the, the academic world, you know, just couldn't go for a, a really catchy title like that. Uh, but this is, uh, this is the book version. And uh, his talk today, uh, as you, that you can see up there, is from a chapter of his book. And I want to mention that uh, we are, is the bookstore people, the bookstore, they're out there in the read. So we will have books available for purchase if, if, uh, if you're interested in doing that. And I know Dr. Perkins will be glad to sign uh, books for anyone who buys one or anyone who, who brought your own that you've, that you've already been reading. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Blake Perkins. Thank you, Brooks. And thanks to Tom Peters and the Ozark Studies uh, Institute for, for hosting me. It's, uh, it's an honor to be able to come back and, and share some of my work here at, uh, at Missouri State. On a cool Monday morning in March 1922, Charles Jeffrey left his home near Jamestown, Arkansas to begin his week's duties as a federal cattle tick inspector. Jeffrey had been hired to inspect quarantine cattle and enforce local compliance with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's tick eradication program designed to eliminate Texas fever or babesiosis. En route to supervise a cattle dipping, Jeffrey met fellow inspector Lee Harper on Hutchison Mountain around 7.30 a.m. And Harper expressed concern to Jeffrey about rumors of anti-dipping threats he had just heard while quail hunting with some friends. Despite threats he himself had recently received, Jeffrey intended to carry on with his duties. Trekking along a wooded farm road, 
Jeffrey was suddenly cut down by a, sun, a thunderous shotgun blast. Harper, who was slightly wounded in the right arm, begged the concealed assassin to spare him and scurried to a house nearby to report the incident. Jeffrey lay gasping for his last breaths, his, filled, his lungs filled with buckshot. Within an hour, Jeffrey was dead, and the county sheriff and a local posse soon arrived at the murder scene, bent on hunting down the assailant. By the next day, state and local law enforcement, with assistance from bloodhounds, had apprehended six suspects and continued to hunt for more. They believed tick eradication opponents in the community had organized a conspiracy to murder Jeffrey. The Jeffrey murder was a particularly horrific instance of a broader challenge to the federal tick eradication program. In her history of the tick program in the South, historian Claire Strom seeks to explain the widespread resistance from small farmers, especially those in the relatively isolated places such as the highlands, and marshes, and piney woods, what she calls the few remaining outlying bastions of southern yeomen. Small farmers opposed the program, according to Strong, because it infringed on their Jeffersonian political ideals and traditional allegiance to local democracy, and because it burdened without benefit semi-subsistence farmers, who she claims raised cattle largely for themselves or for local trade only and had no stake in national markets. Likewise, local historians have argued that fiercely independent Ozarkers saw the tick law as too much government interference in their lives. A closer look at Ozark smallholders and the murder of Charles Jeffrey, however, warrants a more nuanced treatment. Rather than a high statist program impo imposed from bureaucrats in Washington, it was local and regional business elites who instigated and administered a remarkably decentralized tick eradication campaign in the name of efficient and improved agriculture. Small, less capitalized farmers who re received few or no benefits from the program, meanwhile, resented the burdens and expense and viewed it as yet another ruse cooked up by self-serving elites. Most backcountry farmers, furthermore, were in no way isolated from national or even international market forces, nor apparently did they want to be. Despite relative geographic isolation, Small farmers still participated in national markets, and these market trends affected their lives in significant ways. The mast of the open range in the Ozarks was well suited for raising cattle, and many hill farmers used these resources in their entrepreneurial efforts, not simply to sustain their families, but to get ahead in a commercial economy. To borrow the words of Appalachian historian Robert Weiss, economically, localism did not at all imply an anti-commercial or anti-market attitude. While some smallholders raised only one or two cows for strictly subsistence purposes, mostly for milk and butter, cattle represented the most valuable cash commodity for many others, even if their herds were much smaller and comprised poorer stock than those of more prosperous cattlemen. Indeed, it was their connection to national market forces, rather than their disinterest in or isolation from commercial farming that, broad, that brought their opposition to dipping laws to a boil. Although there had been defiance toward the program in, in many parts of the South since its inception in 1906, the deadliest incidents of resistance occurred amid the agricultural crisis of the early 1920s. Many small farmers had benefited from high beef prices, prices driven by increased international demand during World War I and had, accordingly, suffered from the market fallout of the post-war years that sent prices spiraling to their lowest points in more than a decade. Chiefly orchestrated by southern agribusiness and political elites, the eradication program had its origins in a congressional appropriation to the USDA in 1906. A quarantine that roughly followed the northern border of the old Confederacy, but also included Southern California, had been established at the behest of northern beef producers in 1891 to protect northern cattle from Texas fever caused by a protozoa hosted by ticks. This deadly and contagious disease carried by southern cattle bound for slaughter and meat packing houses in the north threatened the herds of northern and midwestern cattlemen whose higher grade breeds were vulnerable to the fever. While native scrub cattle in the south had developed immunity to the fever, the quarantine line posed a disadvantage for the growing number of wealthier cattlemen in the south who were attempting to emulate the capital-intensive Midwestern-style cattle business and sought to participate in higher-grade beef markets. 
Although there was an open season in the winter during which southern cattle could be shipped north without restrictions, the quarantine hindered southern access to the most lucrative northern markets. Cattle had to be either slaughtered in the south and then shipped out, which proved problematic since there were few meat packing houses in the region, or shipped in special quarantine marked railroad cars and slaughtered immediately when they reached their northern destinations. The extra expense and hassle cut significantly into profits, particularly for those larger southern cattlemen investing in higher quality livestock to sell in choice grade markets. But Texas fever also posed a more immediate threat to larger cattlemen attempting to raise top quality purebred stock in the first place. Just as the disease was proving deadly to cattle in the north and Midwest, the fever tick was taking its toll on high grade purebreds imported by more prosperous cattlemen in the south. These well-to-do livestock growers, their political representatives, and the scientific experts promoting their interests at agricultural experiment stations and the, U and the USDA were the key figures in the establishment of the tick program in 1906. Assuming that tick eradication would be welcomed as a progressive measure, the USDA initially embarked on a voluntary program. The USDA's Bureau of Animal Industry worked closely with state experiment stations and with county governments, offering matching funds for voluntary programs and leaving the planning and administration mostly to local officials. The BAI and its supporters soon found, however, that farmers in only a few locales were willing to join their effort, and those tended to be the like-minded cattlemen in more prosperous agricultural areas, those who, not surprisingly, stood to gain the most from, the tick, eradic from tick eradication. In Arkansas, eradication began in the northern part of the state, with special interest given to the relatively prosperous counties of the Springfield Plain subregion of the Ozarks. Washington and Benton counties, the former the home of the state's flagship university, had long set themselves apart from the rest of the rugged Ozarks as a progressive agricultural center. These counties were at the forefront of efforts to establish an improved cattle industry. Generally better off farmers there heeded the suggestions of agricultural scientists at the nearby Agricultural Experiment Station at the University of Arkansas who claimed that in no other state is there greater need of improvement and greater prospective profits from the importation of purebred beef breeds. Progressive farmers and their cattle growers associations in those counties answered the call. The better class of intelligent and up-to-date farmers and stock owners was willing and eager to do all in their power, both by precept and example, to forward the important work of tick eradication, commended the director of the experiment station in 1907. By 1914, Washington and Benton counties, along with several others, had been declared tick-free and were lifted from the federal quarantine. Eradication was less successful in other parts of the region. Smaller and poorer farmers raising scrub stock on the open range were less inclined to see any benefits from the program. Once eradication supporters in the BAI realized that many small farmers were unwilling to cooperate voluntarily, they abandoned the carrot approach for the stick, working through state and local governments to mandate dipping by law. Some historians have viewed the conflict over tick eradication as part of a broader dispute between progressives and traditionalists. These labels, though, run the risk of oversimplification and of misunderstanding the real dynamics of the dispute. As the recent works of historians such as Charles Postel and Elizabeth Sanders have shown, small farmers, the so-called traditionalists in many accounts, often stood among the most determined progressive champions of government-supported educational advancements and scientific farming improvements during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Small farmers in the Ozarks objected not so much to government's expanded role in rural economics and education, but more to how those with the clout pulled the strings and shaped the designs of federal programs for their own ends. While most dipping opponents merely complained or simply refused to dip their cattle until they were fined or had their cattle confiscated, which is what's going on in this newspaper ad here, others vented their anger more forcefully. Some angry farmers in Izzard County destroyed dipping vats with dynamite at Gein and Lunenburg in 1912. Although no one was ever charged, the tick inspector at Lunenburg reported that he had been chased by about 25 night riders and barely escaped their wrath. Such intimidation of inspectors and destruction of dipping vats was repeated on numerous occasions throughout the South. Eradication officials and supporters were appalled 
at such resistance and thought only backwardness and narrow-mindedness could explain such obstinate behavior. Arkansas State Veterinarian W. Linton claimed that ticks were costing the South, the South $40 million annually, which was inexcusable given that the problem could be entirely eliminated with little expense and a little trouble on the part of cattle owners. For Linton, ignorance and indifference were the obstacles. If every farmer understood this question and was willing to spend a few cents and a few minutes time each week, he wrote, between now and the first of next November, every tick in Arkansas could be killed. But for many small farmers, tick eradication was more than a few cents and a few minutes time each week and they remained unconvinced that it was truly beneficial. More prosperous cattlemen were in much better shape to treat their animals for ticks. They were equipped with corrals and pens, neat fences and pastures to manage their herds, and the money and labor to invest in eradication methods. Poor or smallholders, on the other hand, had to round up cattle that roamed free on the open range and drive them to dipping vats through difficult terrain, a nearly impossible task. The program required farmers to dip their cattle once every other week until inspectors declared their district tick-free. For small farmers who usually relied on family and occasionally neighbors for labor, this almost always consumed precious time and resources and distracted them from other important farming ventures. Furthermore, the flat tax of five cents per head on cattle that was levied to help finance the program also pro proved a much bigger thorn in the side of poorer yeomen than more well-to-do cattlemen who believed the tax was well worth it. Even more important, perhaps, was the fact that the program stood to benefit yeoman farmers scarcely, if at all. This was not due to their isolation from national and international markets, though. Rather, a closer look at the differentiation within the beef market reveals that well-to-do cattlemen and smallholders generally targeted different sectors. While wealthier cattlemen with higher quality breeds aimed at the choice grade, top end of the beef market, backcountry farmers, native scrub breeds were generally bound for the low end canned beef market. For small farmers lacking the necessary land and capital to invest in select breeds for choice grade beef, raising lower quality animals for the low end of the market was most feasible and profitable. Raising native scrub cattle on the open range required smaller investments. Smallholders allowed their cattle to subsist mostly on the natural grasses and mast of the, of the open range at little cost. They usually sold their cattle to drovers or drove, them, uh, them, drove their small herds themselves to the nearest railroad town to be loaded onto livestock cars and shipped to market. Farmers in the Arkansas Ozarks frequently shipped their cattle to Missouri. John Quincy Wolfe remembered his uncle selling open range cattle raised in Izzard County during the late 1800s. Very early, uncle saw the profit in raising cattle, for they ran on the free ranges all the year, finding abundant forage in the winter on the south sides of the hills, up the coves, and along the creeks and the river valleys where cane was abundant, recalled Wolf. In the spring, uncle sold from 10 to 25 head of cattle to Missouri buyers, and in the fall, two or three bales of cotton, which brought in more than enough money for the family. Ozark smallholders continued to see the economic benefits of open-range grazing well into the 20th century. Yellville's newspaper reported in June 1921 that George Roberson had shipped a carload of fat cattle to butchers in Springfield, Missouri, the first of the week. These cattle, the paper noted, had grown fat on the open range. Here in the Ozarks, where our range is fine and where cattle have free access to pure running water, they take on flesh very fast and make the very best of beef. In addition to requiring little land, raising cattle on the open range demanded minimal labor, allowing farmers to devote most of their time and energy to other farm endeavors. Thus, even with canner beef, usually bringing less than half the price of top grade beef, small farmers enjoyed significant profits from scrub cattle that best suited the resources at their disposal. As cattle prices in Arkansas more than doubled between 1912 and 1918, it is likely that many who were being forced to dip their cattle dismissed eradication officials' claims that ticks were hurting southern beef prices. Their tick-infested cattle were bringing more money than ever. Furthermore, successful eradication and lifting the quarantine did not necessarily result in the improved prices that officials promised. Although South Carolina, for instance, had been completely freed from the quarantine by 1921, average prices in that state fell from $20.30 per head 
in 1921 to $13.80 in 1922. Similarly, Mississippi's average cattle prices fell from $14.10 per head in 21 to $10.80 in 22, after that state had been released from the quarantine. Many Ozarkers then must have had a hard time buying into experts' claims that tick eradication was necessary and urgent. Exaggerated claims made by frustrated officials in their attempts to educate farmers probably led some smallholders to question the validity of the tick program even more. State Commissioner of Agriculture Clay Sloan went so far as to claim that one tick can draw 200 pounds of blood from one animal in a season. <laughs> the editor of the Batesville Guard, Independence County's leading newspaper, who supported the tick program, was utterly disgusted at such a damaging statement. Why, the dread-blooded... Uh, the dreaded blood-sucking vampires of India, or the gorgeously and most stupendously advertised blood-sweating behemoth of olden circus fame would have no odds on one of the hideous tick monsters with a capacity of a pound of blood a day, he retorted. It is just such freak statements which have caused so much ridicule and opposition to an otherwise intelligent campaign of education. In addition, small farmers' suspicions about the program surely rose as it became obvious that tick eradication was designed to benefit more prosperous cattlemen's other agendas for an improved agricultural industry. This became more than clear when program supporters increased their long-time calls to close the open range in order to accelerate the success of eradication. The director of the Arkansas Experiment Station pointed to the open range as the main factor in propagating and distributing the tick arguing that were a general herd law in force, the tick question would become, if not a simple one, at any rate a much less difficult one than it is at present. Officials advocating to close the open range undoubtedly struck a sensitive nerve in small farmers who counted on the free range for a vital source of farm income. Closing the range would likely mean running many of them out of the cattle business altogether. A few disgruntled Ozarkers took their grievances over the tick program into the courts in hopes of redress, but small farmers typically did not fare well in the courtroom. In 1916, the Arkansas Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the state legislation that enforced mandatory dipping, and the following year it upheld the penalties for violators of the quarantine orders. These rulings confirmed that law-abiding smallholders had no choice but to dip their cattle. Most smallholders grudgingly obeyed and took their cattle to the dipping vats every other week, many undoubtedly grumbling to themselves and their neighbors about the program. Other less scrupulous farmers continued to refuse to dip and risk being fined or having their cattle taken. But during the World War I years, tick eradication was a little easier pill to swallow. They still resented the difficulties of rounding up their cattle and paying the dipping tax for no apparent benefit, but record cattle prices produced uh, during those years likely helped offset the hassle and expense. Although southern newspapers devoted most of their attention to the great surge in cotton prices during the war years, the increased international demand for nearly all American farm products drove other prices, including beef, to unprecedented levels. Whereas the annual average of prices Arkansas cattle farmers received fluctuated around three and a half dollars per hundred pounds between 1909 and 1912, Prices rose to a three-year average of about $4.50 between 1913 and 15, climbed to $4.90 in 1916, and then shot up to $6.40 in 1917, peaking at an annual average of $7 in 1918. In May 1918, average prices in Arkansas hit a whopping $8, $8 per hundred pounds, a level that would not be matched again until 1942. Such an increase in cattle values did not go unnoticed. In an editorial on November the 8th, 1916, the Batesville Guard sought to draw its readers' attention to the tremendous rise in livestock prices. Citing an agricultural official in Texas, the editorial com commented that meat animals are more likely to be higher next year than cotton is likely to remain high. Warning readers not to become too comfortable with good cotton prices, the Texas official explained that in one year, cotton has risen from 10 to 18 cents. It can fall in another year back to 10. Referencing high demand in war-torn Europe, he assured readers that the cattle market promised to be much safer and more stable than cotton, since people can economize in the use of cotton goods, but cannot economize much in the matter of food. 
Analysis of personal property records of the small farmers involved in the Charles Jeffrey murder case suggests that many of them responded to these market incentives. Although most lacked significant capital, many found ways to seize the opportunity. Many who lacked the money to greatly expand their small farm operations still enlarged their herds when possible by buying a few head from neighbors when they had extra cash or by keeping some of the heifers or female calves from natural reproduction to add to the next year's stock of breeding cows. Even for those who did not expand their herds, the high prices they received from selling each season's naturally produced calves put more money in their pockets than most had ever imagined before the war. But while smallholders enjoyed the record prices of the war years, they also suffered from the agricultural market crisis that ensued when high demand wore off after the war. In Arkansas, the prices cattle farmers received per 100 pounds fell from the $8 peak in May 1918 to $5.80 by the end of 1919. At the end of 1920, prices had fallen to $4.40 per 100 pounds, plummeting to a mere $3.20 by December 1921. In the words of historian Gilbert Fite, farmers were not only discouraged over low prices, they were downright angry. It is important to situate the escalation of violent resistance to tick eradication within the context of post-war agricultural panic rather than just explaining it away as a simple continuation of rural Jeffersonian ideology and inborn resentment toward federal government's enroachment upon local rights. While small farmers may have been able to endure tick eradication amid the high prices of the war years, the post-war beef market fallout restored the sharper than ever pains of cattle dipping, pains that some folks were evidently no longer willing to tolerate. To compound the problem of falling prices, eradication officials in Arkansas decided to stiffen regulations. New regulatory revisions went into effect in March 1919 that outright prohibited farmers from selling any cattle from a quarantine district that had not been completely declared tick-free and issued a signed certificate by a federal inspector. Now, no longer could farmers even sell cattle simply marked quarantine since they had to possess an inspector's certificate to sell them at all. With farmers' ability to sell cattle greatly impeded and with prices plunging in January 1922 to the lowest they had been since 1911, panic spawned a surge in violence. It was in this atmosphere of boiling tempers that an unknown assassin gunned down Charles Jeffrey on March the 20th, 1922, resulting in the eventual arrest of nine suspected conspirators. Questioning revealed that these suspects and about 30 other men had attended a meeting at one suspect's farm after church on the Sunday afternoon prior to the murder, where officials believed the dipping opponents had plotted to kill Jeffrey. The six suspects initially arrested were held at the county jail for a hearing before Justice of the Peace J.A. Holmes to commence on March the 24th. Meanwhile, law officials and their bloodhounds searched for co-conspirators and reported that unknown murder accomplices had been attempting to throw the hounds off the trail by firing the woods near the murder scene. Like the wild rumors of communist conspiracy that circulated during Arkansas's infamous Elaine race riot of 1919, Red Scare hysteria found another outlet in the press's coverage of rural whites' anti-dipping defiance. Just as Georgia's state veterinarian had condemned what he called a Bolshevik contingent for dynamiting dipping vats in his state in the summer of 1917, the Arkansas Democrat newspaper in Little Rock linked dipping opposition to socialist anarchy claiming that one of the suspects, James McGee, was a socialist leader in his section. There's good reason to speculate that McGee may have supported socialist politics, as many others in the region did. Uh, sometime after 1910, McGee and his family had come to Hutchison Mountain from Kiowa County, Oklahoma, a well-known stronghold of agrarian socialism. Moreover, the Socialist Party had been very active in Independence County, Arkansas, especially between 1908 and 1912, when it ran a full slate in each election. Under the leadership of the Populist Farmers Union member, W.P. Dathero, the local party organization sought to appeal especially to poor farmers. Socialists in the Western South, especially the Working Class Union, headquartered in Van Buren, Arkansas, which claimed as many as 35,000 Oklahoma and Arkansas farmers among its membership, were among the most aggressive opponents of the dipping mandate in their broader stand against the farmer who farms the farmer. The 1920 election returns, however, reveal that if McGee was a socialist organizer, he had yet to win over very many votes 
for his party on Hutchison Mountain. Of the 27 votes cast in his township in the presidential election, only four went to socialist Eugene Debs, while one of 26 votes went to the socialist gubernatorial candidate, Sam Boozler. Instead, most of the township voted Republican. But this in itself might have been an expression of political protest against the Arkansas and local political establishment in a solidly democratic county. The stigma of anarchy attached to dipping opposition could be seen clearly in the strategies of both the prosecution and the defense in the hearing on March the 24th and 25th. The prosecution set out to show that the angry dipping opponents had called a secret meeting to organize Jeffrey's assassination as an act of lawless rebellion. Defense attorney Earl Casey, who was fully aware of the incriminating image, sought to portray the suspects not as dipping opponents, but as upright citizens who were simply confused about the technicalities of the law. Casey argued that their tick meeting was not a secret gathering of raging dipping opponents, but rather a gathering of law-abiding men discussing and informing one another about the dipping question. The prosecution suggested that dipping opponents had paid local riffraff Paul Curtis to do the shooting. And that's him up right there. Bloodhounds had led, law, had led lawmen to the home of fellow suspect Aaron Struthers, where Curtis admitted he had stayed the night before the shooting. And that's Struthers up there at the top. Curtis had earned a reputation as a lawless character. In 1915, he had pleaded guilty on charges of disturbing religious services. He was also sentenced in 1916 to a year behind bars for stealing two mules. Even more important, only months before Jeffrey's killing, Curtis had also been indicted for another, in another murder case, though he was acquitted for lack of evidence. Curtis, a sharecropper who lived with his elderly mother and had no property of his own, also testified that he had recently been looking to hire himself out as a farm laborer with no success. The prosecution argued that Curtis, whose boots matched tracks found near the murder scene, must have taken the cash at the Sunday tick meeting and then shot Jeffrey in cold blood the next morning. Although Justice Holmes was convinced enough to hold the defendants without bail for a grand jury, the prosecution got very little help from tight-lipped witnesses. The Arkansas Democrat reported that most of those placed on the stand by the state made poor witnesses, plainly showing signs of fear and lapses of memory. Witnesses, most of whom admitted that they had attended the tick meeting, usually kept their statements brief and vague, showing a clear reluctance to say anything that might implicate someone. This only bolstered the prosecution's certainty that some sort of an organized murder plot had been schemed, but it also frustrated efforts to pin down hard evidence to convict the suspects beyond a reasonable doubt. For the defense, tight-lipped witnesses were a blessing, especially since Attorney Casey was unsuccessful in his attempt to draw attention away from the fact that most of the men at the meeting were dipping opponents. When questioned by the prosecution about their opposition, the defendants and witnesses who attended the meeting tried to elude the issue by stating that they were law-abiding citizens. When questioned about his views on tick eradication, farmer J.W. Burnett, who was also a justice of the peace in his township, even claimed initially that he had voted for the dipping tax and dipped every time they notified me. When pressed further, however, Burnett finally admitted, I can't say that I loved it and I'm opposed to it if I can get around it without disobeying the law. S.D. Lambert, the suspect at, at whose residence the tick meeting had been held, also tried to claim that he supported the eradication program, but it failed miserably. Uh, to sound convincing. Still, despite failures to dodge the anti-dipping issue, the defense benefited from witnesses' reluctance to provide convicting testimony. For most observers, there was little doubt that some, if not most, of the men placed on the stand had been involved in some way or at least knew who killed Charles Jeffrey. The day after the hearing concluded, on Sunday, March the 26th, an angry lynch mob assembled in Batesville and threatened the defendants, despite pleas from Jeffrey's eldest sons to allow the legal system to run its course. Sheriff Noah Harris took no chances and quietly transferred the suspects from the county jail to the state prison in Little Rock for safekeeping. Ultimately, though, the prosecution failed to come up with any new evidence strong enough for a conviction. And its principal evidence, the bloodhound trails and boot prints found near the murder scene, had too many holes to stand alone. The grand jury indicted Paul Curtis for first-degree murder and six others as accomplices, but the prosecution could not unearth the smoking gun evidence needed to put the suspects away. 
Just who pulled the trigger and who was involved in Jeffrey's murder will forever remain a mystery. Local tradition has reached several different verdicts, from beliefs that Curtis was hired by dipping opponents, as the prosecution argued, to claims that Curtis acted alone simply because he was a depraved character who was believed to have murdered before. Others offered completely different explanations, such as one that said the dipping altercation had only escalated a deeper grudge between one of the suspects and Charles Jeffrey over a sexual affair rumor. Still others attributed the murder to simple jealousy over Je Jeffrey's coveted federal inspector position. According to Jeffrey family lore, Curtis eventually confessed to the shooting years later on his deathbed and asked for Jeffrey's widow to beg for her forgiveness. But what is not disputable is the fact that the murder occurred amid passionate resentment toward mandatory tick eradication during desperate times for small farmers in the Ozarks. Even as the jailed murder suspects awaited their trial, violent resistance persisted in Independence County. Three days after the murder, the inspector at Union Hill, located about 15 miles southeast of Jeffreys District, reported that his own barn had been burned to the ground by night riders. So down here, uh, let's see, there's Jamestown. This is where Jeffrey was from. So this is part of the county we're talking about. He also turned over a threatening notice that had been posted at a local vat by dipping opponents and several other anonymous letters warning him that his life was in danger. Fearing for their lives, all federal tick inspectors in the mountains of Independence County temporarily resigned their posts and the county supervisors suspended dipping in the area until federal marshals could arrive to quell the violence. But before the nine marshals arrived to restore order, more violence erupted. On April the 2nd, a few days after another dipping vat had been destroyed, a band of about 20 night riders set fire to the barn of a well-to-do farmer, the brother of a prominent local merchant, and a vocal tick eradication supporter, Dave Wyatt, in the Rosie community. Although a night watchman and several alarmed neighbors were able to fire off about 30 shots at the fleeing bandits, only one horse was apprehended. 48 hours later, the night riders struck again. This time, Wyatt and his brothers discovered the intruders before they could damage any property and unloaded a barrage of gunfire in their direction as they fled. One vigilante appeared to have been hit, but was rescued by a fellow night rider before Wyatt and his men could capture him. Local officers arrested five suspects within the next week. The initial presence of federal marshals slowed violence considerably, but it did not end it entirely. It seems that many dipping opponents who had previously formed larger bands of night riders were no longer willing to risk being shot up by federal marshals. Ten days after the last encounter at the Wyatt Farm, another tick eradication supporter in the Rosie community, Ira Castleberry, had his property targeted by what appeared to be a lone marauder. A federal marshal, accompanied by Castleberry and Wyatt, discovered the bandit slipping through some bushes on his way to set fire to Castleberry, Castleberry's barn. They opened fire, but he escaped. And a lone firebug returned to Dave Wyatt's farm several days later, the sixth attempt to destroy his large barn. A local policeman and Wyatt's two sons, who were standing guard, attempted to apprehend the man, but the surprised would-be arsonist bolted over a nearby gate and escaped, though not before ripping half his jacket from his body on the barbed wire as he barely dodged uh, a bullet from the officer's revolver. With this incident, violent resistance petered out and the federal marshals oversaw the resumption of tick eradication in the area. Amid the chaos of the tick rebellion, observers pondered the reasons for such violent behavior. The Arkansas Democrat attributed the violence to a backward mountain culture. In this rebellious district, claimed the Democrat, live a great many mountaineers who up to a certain point are illiterate and do not keep abreast of the times. Ultimately, living in the mountains, they oppose a great many laws of the state and federal government, and especially such laws as interfere with their own personal freedom and bring extra expense or work upon themselves, the paper argued. They feel that the dipping law places a restriction on their personal freedom. Perhaps there is reason to assume that dipping opponents in Independence County had come to re resent federal intrusions into their lives. Frustration over the tick program may have built upon considerable resentment toward the military draft during World War I. Jeffrey's accused murderer, Paul Curtis, had unsuccessfully requested exemption from the draft on the grounds that his mother depended on him for her livelihood. Another murder suspect, J.W. Scoggins, 
outright dodged the draft and had hidden out during the war. At the root of such objections to government authority, though, was their perception that the prosperous and well-to-do were using this power for their own gain at the expense of ordinary people like themselves. A close analysis of the dynamics of society and economy in the Hutchinson Mountain community suggests that the high cattle prices of the war years brought high hopes to many small farmers and their families. They saw economic opportunity in the cattle market and speculated accordingly. Historian Altina Waller notes in her study of the post-Civil War period in the Tug Valley of southern West Virginia and eastern Kentucky, the setting of the infamous Hatfield-McCoy feud, that the most important function of a father in smallholder farm societies was economic and social support. Fathers felt obligated to provide their sons at least a modest start in life, and sons expected it of them. In this age of increasingly bleak prospects for smallholders, High cattle prices during the war years afforded farmers and their sons on Hutchinson Mountain hope against a frustratingly barren future. Such prospects may have brought a few farmers into the community in the first place. S.D. Lambert had sold his row crop farm in the lowlands of Randolph County, Arkansas and purchased a small farm on Hutchinson Mountain in 1910. Lambert's oldest son, 22-year-old James, who was eventually indicted, had recently married and moved to a place of his own on the mountain by 1920. According to the 1920 census, James owned his new home, and personal property tax records show that he had three head of cattle of his own, though he undoubtedly continued to work for his father, too. Lambert also had two other sons, ages 21 and 19, still living with him, but soon to be leaving the nest, not to mention four younger children. So for Lambert, who it's worth mentioning, had taken out a mortgage on his own home by 1920, the cattle industry was vital to his family's economic security and dreams for the future. Lambert sought to capitalize on the record cattle prices of the World War I years. Although personal property tax records do not provide a full picture of market transactions, an analysis of herd sizes and assessment values of cattle reveal a great deal about yeoman farmers and market trends. In 1917, Lambert owned 30 cattle assessed at $300. Plainly more than he needed for subsistence, they, amounted, they counted for 38% of his total $790 personal property value. In 1918, he enlarged his herd to 40 cattle, listed at $600, now representing 67% of his $900 total valuation. And in 1919, Lambert had 60 cattle, assessed at $900, which made up 78% of his $1,150 total worth, doubling his herd in just three years and putting a disproportionate amount of his personal assets into cattle, Lambert was clearly banking on the beef market. But as the market plummeted after the war, Lambert felt the pinch. In 1920, Lambert's investment backfired. He had enlarged his herd to 80 cattle, but the major decline in prices, with the major decline in prices, the assessed value of his cattle had fallen from $900 to $800, even though his herd consisted of 20 more head than it had the year before. The following year, after an apparent effort to trim back a bad investment, Lambert owned 60 cattle that were only worth $450 and his total personal property valuation now slumped to $690. Lambert, in fact, had organized the Sunday tick meeting in the first place and held it at his residence. Although the grand jury apparently acquitted Lambert himself, his son James was one of the seven eventually indicted for murder. Indeed, the Lamberts, who were probably the hardest hit by receding cattle prices, had the biggest and most expensive job of dipping their 60-plus cattle that roamed the open range and were undoubtedly among the most resentful toward the tick program. Other local farmers felt the squeeze of declining prices and the sharper pains of dipping by the 1920s. C.W. Embry, who was arrested but not indicted by the grand jury, attempted to improve his economic prospects by investing in cattle but came into the game too late for it to pay off. In all likelihood, poorer farmers like Embry tried to invest their meager resources in cattle when the market slumped and cattle could be purchased a little more cheaply in 1920 and 21, expecting that the market would soon rebound. Embry, a poor farm laborer with no personal property at all to assess in 1917 or 18, appears to have saved some of his wages and bought his first three cattle worth $45 in 1919. He increased his holdings to 10 cattle in 1920, but more than tripling his herd, only a little more than doubled his cattle value to $100. Tax records from 1921 suggest that he had stopped investing in cattle, but his 10 head were now assessed at only $70. For disaffected farmers, there was a great deal to resent about Charles Jeffrey. The owner of two farms in the area, Jeffrey, 
while apparently never ex expanding the size of his own livestock herd, must have enjoyed the unprecedented prices he got for his calves during the war years. But the pressure of falling beef prices after the war did not affect him like it did his poorer neighbors, who depended on cattle for an essential part of their family's income. In addition to his farms, Jeffrey owned a blacksmith shop and a sawmill, and he held a federal contract to carry the mail for the U.S. Postal Service. During the war, Jeffrey had also obtained a lucrative government contract to provide lumber for the U.S. war effort. Ironically, versions of local tradition say that Jeffrey's initial opposition to, the cattle dip, to cattle dipping had been widely known throughout the area. Jeffrey's opinion on the matter changed abruptly, however, when the county's tick eradication supervisor, W.H. Lendreth, offered him a salaried position as an inspector in his locale. Already enraged over the pains of dipping, tick eradication opponents likely despised taking order from a well-connected man who had only recently sided with them against an unnecessary law that stood to benefit only the prosperous and well-to-do. Such antipathy toward the eradication officials was widespread anyway. The Arkansas Democrat noted that one of the public arguments made by those who oppose and fight against the dipping law as, is that it has gotten up to give a select few good paying jobs. A Stone County man also mockingly detested the greed and corruption of the tick program. This will be a lonesome old place to live when the tick eradicator, eradicators get all the ticks eradicated. They may eradicate for a thousand years and there will not be any difference in the amount of ticks. The one tick thereafter is a big round tick. I call it a dollar. When they're all eradicated, then the ticks, the money, will be gone. The poor we have with us always. Resentment then must have been especially strong toward Jeffrey, the man after the ticks in their rural community, and this truly made him a walking bullseye. The myth of a distinct culture of feuding and violence in the southern mountains has been largely laid to rest by historians. Vigilantism, however, has long been part of the fabric of rural America. Given the circumstances of the Hutchison Mountain community in the early 1920s, the presence of vigilante justice is not surprising. As historian Altina Waller has observed in the Hatfield-McCoy affair, southern mountaineers who had previously been almost exceptionally apt to take their grievances into the courtrooms might decide to take extra legal measures when they felt alienated from the legal system and feared that justice would not prevail. For small farmers in the Ozarks, the legal system appeared rigged against important aspects of their lives. They seem to have felt justified in resisting dipping laws by extra legal means as a ne necessary fight against the well-to-do, selfish interests who were denying their rights to participate on even ground in an agricultural market and undermining their quest for a more democratic political economy. Examining the changes wrought in the community during the 1920s after federal force overpowered dipping resistance leaves little reason to wonder why so much emotion surrounded the hopes of cattle farming and the obstacles of mandatory tick eradication. Efforts to eradicate ticks continued after 1922, but the prices that Arkansas cattle farmers received continued to fall even lower, bottoming out at $2.80 per 100 pounds in October 1924. Prices gradually rebounded in the final years of the decade, but just in time to be sapped by the Great Depression and long after many young farmers had fled the economically distressed community. The 1920s was a period of major population exodus. Small farmers were typically pulled by urban opportunities and pushed by agricultural crisis. Typical out-migrants from Hutchison Mountain were young men whose hopes of settling down near their families on farms of their own had likely been crushed by their and their father's inability to profit enough from cattle farming to give them a secure start. Census records for 1930 indicate that usually only those young men who could step in to fill the shoes of deceased or retiring fathers on small farms were able to stay in the community. Other young men appear to have realized that they would have to leave. Frank Holland, a key suspect in the night riding activities at the Dave Wyatt farm in Rosie, was undoubtedly feeling, the des feeling desperate in the early 1920s. Holland and his wife and two children were living with his wife's parents in 1920, where Holland worked for wages on his father-in-law's farm undoubtedly hoping to own his own farm soon. By 1930, with hopes of making it in rural Independence County snuffed out, Holland had moved his family to a rental house in the White County Lowlands, where both he and his wife worked for wages as farmhands in the cotton fields. The anti-dipping rebellion and assassination of Charles Jeffrey was the culmination of anger over what small hill farmers perceived as an unjust and abusive federal program during a period of desperation and anxiety. Small farmers struggled to ensure 
their families' economic security and relied greatly on the profitability of cattle raising to do so. The high cattle prices of the World War I years gave them high hopes, but these were shot down as beef prices plunged below pre-war levels after international demand subsided following the war. For small farmers, the mandatory dipping administered by and for local elites was costly and troublesome, made all the worse because they stood to reap none of the benefits. Most backcountry farmers seemed to have rebelled against the program because it obstructed their ability to participate in the national cattle market at a time when their hopes were high and because it benefited only, only elite cattlemen at their expense. They rarely resisted out of some authority-defying cultural impulse or because they had no stake in commercial agriculture. Inequality spawned desperation and bitterness to create an explosive environment of resistance that was ripe for tragedy. Thank you. I assume we have some quick time for questions. Yeah, we've Do they still dip cattle? I'm sorry? Do they still dip cattle? I'm not, a, I'm not aware of it. Most, uh, most spray today. Most, most, uh, and they were doing spraying a little bit in this time, but the, the, the dipping was a more common method. But the program actually continued through the 1940s, although they had kind of shrunk it down uh, to the, uh, in, in Texas, along the Rio Grande. Uh, so, there's actually a book out there um, recently published uh, that looks at not just this, but several other kind of scientific programs like this that, that uh, were aimed to you know, uh, deal with various agricultural environmental factors. And they, and they argue that it actually was a, a rather a success, at least for eliminating this particular disease, the babesiosis. Does it still occur? What's that? The, the, the babesiosis. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware that the babesiosis, although there are other kinds of tick so borders. So they're for other things. Yeah. In our our neck of the woods in Arkansas, uh, a new, I guess I guess it's a new, uh, a new disease called anaplasmosis is is believed to be carried by ticks, and so that's. But there are other other ones. Yeah. Is there a picture of the cattle that being the slideshow? Uh, yeah, I had one uh, one example. Let me go back to it. Uh, Toward the beginning, I believe, it showed a vat where they were driving them in, running through the, you know, these were made out of concrete, running through. Here, here we go. Uh, and another complaint I didn't touch on, but in some cases, I mean, cattle would uh, uh, get injured or, you know, going into the vat or trying to come out and, uh, or, you know, or, or, or die uh, somewhere along to and from the vat. And, so that was sometimes a complaint on farms too. Uh, so in your book, th this is just one instance of that you argue that, as I as I read it, that the real fight was between the local elites and the rural yeoman. Yeah, I think so. Uh, but also, isn't there another sort of thing, uh, sort of a long struggle going between what I call Big A, you know, that that yeah. that the the elites were really sort of bought into Big A, or they might have the land that was conducive to Big A. And you know that was happening throughout the Midwest. It happened in Iowa too. And, and I mean, do you think that's also part of the struggle? Is like not only what we're going to grow in the Ozarks and Brooks. You know, we've tried growing everything just about, uh, except like bananas or something. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, but also, sort of the size and scope of agriculture. Oh yeah, I definitely think that's a, a big, big part of, of the pattern here. What's going on? Uh, uh, even in the Ozarks. In, in, you know, you see it less, you see the rise of tenancy and so forth, uh, the numbers aren't as high, uh, but they're, they're getting higher, uh, just as tenancy is getting higher in, in the deep south. And uh, plus, uh, I would argue, I think I do touch on this a little bit in the book, but that even if, you know, you, you also have to look at the expansion of farms in the Ozarks onto what it might be considered more marginal types of land as smaller farmers, you know, uh, they end up moving on up the hillside, maybe up on top of the you know, side of the mountain or so forth to, to farm. And, and, the, and the, you know, kind of the elites end up kind of gobbling up the creek bottoms and the river, river valleys and things like that. So, yeah, I do think that's a, a yeah, this, the emergence, the transformation of, of agriculture from this period, especially, and of course, accelerates uh, after World War I, is a, is a, is a huge part of the story. Sounds like it was a perfect storm here between 
the economic pressures going on and a person who having switched gears and making money off everybody was ripe for killing. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, again, that was that, I, I'll, that was just local lore, so there's no way to, yeah. to pin down for sure that you know, he was an outspoken uh, critic of the program before, but I mean, it sounds fairly convincing that he might have been. I think you got a hand up here. Yeah, it was, uh, did it be harmful to cattle at all, like if they drank the chemicals or anything? Uh, you know, I, I don't know that they would drink drink the stuff, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, there, there were, again, there were some complaints about things like that, of having, you know, getting, getting the cows back home and some of them dying, whether from, you know, the unknown there, but from the solution itself or from maybe getting overheated on, on the trip back to the farm or, or whatever, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there are some of these, the remains of these old vats still around in different places. And uh, I know the uh, Arkansas Historic Preservation Program has done some, have uh, kind of gotten archaeologists out there to document some of these sites. And they have warnings that, you know, that this, this was an arsenic solution. So be careful, you know, around, around these places. Uh, I had a similar question about the chemicals that in the dip where they absorbed into the beef? Were there so, an issue with humans absorbing this stuff? I mean, not that I'm aware of. Uh, it, uh, I, you know, that's, that's over my head. <laughs> I don't know the, uh, what, what really what all was in this chemical and how it worked. Uh, but I assume it was, I mean, again, we, farmers still do this and spray their cattle for flies and, and, and ticks and things like that. And I assume the idea that in any way that it works the same way Arkansas than in Springfield because you said that they would uh, ship their cattle off to Springfield because it was uh, tick-free. So was it more of like uh, there were less ticks in Springfield than in Arkansas? Uh, I doubt it. Uh, I, I doubt <laughs> that was the case. I would imagine that uh, when the in 1891 when they drew up the, the look boundaries that state line was just convenient probably. I mean for most cases it, it, it dipped in some areas, but. But yeah, um, and again, the, the big big issue there was in the Springfield area, you would have had more of the purebred raising going on, kind of this modern cattle industry that you think that was highly vulnerable to the disease. But as far as tick population, uh, not traced around the outskirts of Springfield a whole lot lately, but I'm, I'm sure you could get ticks. Uh, well, pretty good species of ticks too. Maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe uh, uh, right, yeah. Teal. Right. Areas. That's probably and and, so. and, and, and tra the I mean they, they obviously transmit this in, in those, in those uh, cattle that, that are affected by babesiosis. So yeah, that's right. That's right. Question. Um, so was it just like a few northern cases that made them decide to shut off all the transportation, or was it like a wide like? Right yeah, you know, I haven't looked into the, just how widespread that was, but it, it's significant enough, at least for powerful enough people to uh, take take that up as an issue and start really pressuring the USDA to, uh, to establish a quarantine. So, but I've not really looked at it from the kind of northern perspective as much. What's going on uh, in the 1890s? Why did you choose this chapter? Ah. Yeah, it's good. I have, I have that choice in several. I mean, obviously, I can't give you the whole book here in one one set. Again, I uh, just uh, I think it's an interesting story and uh, one that kind of illustrates some of the, the broader themes that I uh, that I argue in, in the book and touch on in the book. Yeah. This is one of the other theses that all of these micro histories that you go through um, that. You know, it wasn't like the Ozarkers were just anti-federal. They were very selective and, and really quite rational in their opposition to certain things, whether it was moonshining or uh, you know, the draft during World War I or pick eradication or even the war on poverty. Uh, they, they didn't, in, that one, that, in that case, I think that the uh, local elite presented that the money was going directly to the needy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the yeah. checks didn't get funneled right. through the local. Uh, but it, the point, and I think when Marl kind of touched on it with the ball mob too, it, it was selective. It was not just run them up. Or it wasn't just anti-federal 
was very selective and odd. It's truly rational. Sure, yeah. I mean, uh, I talk about the significance of the, of the populist movement in the, in the region. And uh, I mean, in, in many respects, that was a very pro government kind of uh, movement. You know, I mean, they were calling on expanded federal powers that would especially <coughs> help, you know, in their mind, rein in the unfairness of, of American uh, capitalist economy and so on. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's interesting, though, it seems like a lot of times when it came to violence, it was personal. It was even, you know, the ball number. I mean, it was it was a combination of frustration, anger, and I never liked that guy in the first place. Yeah, yeah, and and, and it's feeling again that you know I can't get justice anywhere I go. You know, right. kind of thing that seems to. Yeah, we got uh, time for one more question, and then we'll call it an evening. Yeah, I got one. Uh, what was the problem with the ticks? Did they kill the cattle? Did they give them the waste? <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they, they were deadly. I mean, they, they eventually uh, would, uh, especially you know, for these, these purebreds that uh, had never had you know, exposure to these before, they would kill them. Yeah, they would, uh, and, and they probably were anyway, even, even though these southern kind of native cattle had kind of adapted over the eons. Uh, and I developed, as I said, a kind of immunity. They still probably uh, did inhibit their weight gain and things like that. So yeah, it was inhibiting weight gain, but yeah, it was even, it was deadly. So it was, I mean, uh, uh, I guess sort of making them anemic uh, would be uh, probably how that worked. Uh, you know, know the, the science behind that. But it didn't pass anything on to people that ate meat. The people, no, no, as far as I, as far as I know, yeah. All right, we've got uh, we've got some complimentary copies of Ozark's watch up here on the front table, and Dr. Perkins will be out uh, outside the door here if you want to purchase a copy of Hillbilly Hellraisers. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.